Hello class, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with today's warm up. So our warm up is going to be um, about our highs and our lows. So to go more in depth about this for our highs, we want to um, talk about the highlight of our day. And then for our lows, what the worst part of our uh, day or our week was, um, I'll go ahead and get us started. So my high is that I get to go to Six Flags. Um, for my birthday. And my low is that I'm having to stay today, which is Wednesday, um, past 7 p.m. trying to get this recording done for you guys so that y'all can get um, some feedback on how to work on this review. So take some time, talk with your peers, come back, and then we'll get started, okay? All right, so I'm going to work on this first problem right here, which, which says to provide the following information based off of this quadratic function. I need to start off by pointing out what my axis of symmetry is. I'm going to use yellow. And remember, we can find the axis of symmetry by creating a vertical line going straight through that vertex. That means that it hits at x equals one, that is my first answer. Let me do it in black, x equals one. Where's my vertex? Well, I just touched it right now. It is at one, negative four, one, negative four. Here, we need to talk about whether or not our quadratic function is a minimum or maximum. Remember, if it's a minimum, then we're gonna have a U shape. If it's a maximum, we're going to have an upside down U shape, shape or an N shape. So our answer here is minimum. Now we need to work on our Y intercepts. That's where my parabola touches my Y axis. That would be here. So my Y axis was right here. So it touches it at negative three. But on test day, you need to make sure that you write this as an ordered pair, otherwise you're gonna um, lose that point, that, um, that answer. So here I would need to write it as zero, negative three. Now it needs us to list our x-intercepts, that's where it touches my x-axis. So I will go ahead and mark these two points. That would be negative one, zero, and three, zero. I'm gonna look at my picture now and figure out what my domain is. Well, if I start from my left-hand side and I make my way to see where it first touches, touches it at you know this arrow, which tells me that it's gonna keep on going and going and going in the negative direction. So we're gonna have negative infinity. And if I try to figure out where my ending point is for my graph, well, it stops here essentially, but notice how that arrow um, is there, that means that it's going to keep on going and going and going. So for that reason, my domain is negative infinity, infinity, to infinity. We're going to go ahead and now look at our range that is determined by getting a horizontal line and seeing where that line first touches my parabola. That would be at negative four. And if I were to try to see where the cap is or where it actually stops, we'll notice that as I move this, it's going to hit the, that arrow and that arrow is going to keep on going up and up and up. Since it keeps going up, we're going to have that our stopping point is actually going to be infinity, positive infinity. Okay, you guys will be required to do um, this second piece. Let's go ahead and check out this problem. We are asked to write the vertex form equation of a parabola with the following given pieces of information. We have that the vertex is negative two, three. And we have that that parabola that actually goes through point one, two. Um, we went over a lesson where we try to get the A value. And after we got the A value, we could plug it into the vertex form. But let's get a refresher of what the vertex form even is. Remember, our vertex form is going to be Y 
equals a times x minus h squared plus k. I'm trying to find that a value. I should already know what my h and k are. My h is given by my vertex and so is my k. This is h, this is k. Now, what can I do with that point? That point should give me my x and y value. That way I can plug in those specific pieces. So let's do that. Let's start off by plugging in. We're going to plug in our h and k. This will give me y equals a times x minus, hmm, this would be plus two then, squared minus three. Now I will plug in my x and y value. That y will be replaced with the two. We'll have a times one plus two squared minus three. Now we can simplify. We'll always want to start off with whatever's in the parentheses. So everything else is going to be rewritten. I'm going to have two equals a times three squared minus three. Then I'll rewrite this as two equaling, and then three squared, that's the same thing as nine. So I'm gonna write nine a minus three. Then I'll try to isolate that a. Remember, I'm trying to get what a is. So I need to add three to both sides. That should then leave me with five equals nine a. And then I will divide both sides by nine a. So my a value is five over nine. Let's go ahead and work on our vertex form equation. Well, this is just plug and chug at this point. I should have y equals whatever my a value is, which is five over nine. Then I'll put x minus whatever my h value is, which in this case is negative two, so it's gonna be a plus two squared. And then whatever my k is, which is negative three, so I'm gonna put negative three. All right. You guys will be expected to complete this other question. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and go over a couple of problems on this second page. Let's start off with the top left. I'm going to go through a list of steps. And for all of the problems, all of the trinomials or binomials here, we're going to do these three um, general steps. There might be some more, but we're going to start off with three gen general steps. We're going to ask ourselves what the GCF is. In this particular problem, my GCF is one. The next thing I'm going to ask myself is if there's any special patterns. I'm gonna write that special patterns. I'm gonna write it abbreviated as SP. So that's if I'm trying to look for any perfect squares. Well, Negative 12 isn't perfect square and negative, I mean, and 35 is not a perfect square. So for that reason, there are no special patterns. The last thing I need to check for is what my A value is. What is my A value here? Well, that is one. Okay. So this is how we wanna start off each problem. Now for this particular situation, since I have that my a value is equal to one, um, I can just use the x method. So I'm gonna go ahead and label what my a, b, and c are, and then we'll get started with that x method. So remember at the top, that um, little first triangle, the very top, is going to be a times c. Well, that is 35, and then my b, is 12. 
So I need to find two numbers that when I multiply them together, that's going to give me 35. But when I add them together, it's going to give me 12. So I need to write the multiples or the factors of um, 35. So let's see, 1 times 35 and 5 times 7. Um, I'm seeing that probably that 5 and 7 is going to give me 12 because if I add them together, that'll give me 12. So now I can rewrite this as x plus 5 and x plus 7. This is my answer. Right. Next question. Let's do this middle piece right here. We're going to, again, start off by writing what the greatest common factor is. Here, I see that they all have a C in common. So that is my GCF. Now I need to check to see if there's any special patterns. Well, negative three, that's not the perfect square. So no, we have no special patterns. Let's write that down. Special patterns, no. Last, we need to check what our A value is. So if I look at this, it is in fact one, A equals one. So easy enough, we'll be able to um, go through the process fairly easily, okay? Um, so, oh, my bad. We're, but when we find the GCF, when we find the GCF, we'll, we still will have that A is equal to one, but when we have the GCF, we actually need to pull it out first. So I would write C times C squared minus uh, three C plus two. We're still gonna have that our A value is equal to one. Our B is going to be negative three and our C, I mean, our yes, our C value is going to be two. We really should have used a different variable. It's kind of confusing. Um, okay, so now we'll use the X method to figure out how to factor this trinomial right here into something a little bit um, more nicer. So two binomials. So A times C is two, B is negative three. So I need to figure out two numbers that when I multiply them together, it's gonna give me positive two, but when I add them together, it'll give me negative three. I'm gonna have that negative two and negative one, give me that. So let me go ahead and rewrite this. Please do not forget to bring down that C. Okay, don't forget about it. So we're gonna put C times X minus two. That comes from this piece. And then we'll have X minus one, which comes from this second piece. Next. We're going to, again, start off by figuring out what our GCF is. Here we have that it is one. Now we look to see if there's any special patterns. Let's see, so here nine, that's a perfect square. Um, X squared is also perfect square and four is also perfect square. So yes, we do have a special pattern. Now, what do we do when we have a special pattern? We're going to, um, use our little uh, difference of perfect squares formula. So we're going to write that down here just in case we need a refresher. Okay. So essentially, I'm going to kind of connect this. That 9x is this whole thing. And that four is this whole thing. So I need to figure out what my A values are that's going to make this statement true. Well, when A is equal to three X, that's gonna be true for my A squared. And when my B is two, then this statement right here is also gonna be true. So now I can rewrite it as two binomials. I will put three X minus four times three X plus four. That's my final answer. 
I should probably box my answers. I'm gonna go back and box them. Bam. Okay. Next, let's do this bottom right piece. Okay. Um, for this one, we're gonna again start off by finding our GCF. We're gonna find that that's one. Then we'll look for special patterns. That's where I'm looking for perfect squares. Well, I've got a five and five is not a perfect square. So our answer is no. Then we'll move on to what our A value is. Our A here is two. Now this is different from all the other situations that we've come across where um, for this, situation right here are, well, I mean, that wasn't really applicable, but for this problem right here, our A value was one. And then up here, up top, our A value was also one. But now for this problem, we have that our A is two. So we have two options that we covered in class. The first one is that we can use the box method or we could use split down the middle method. For this problem specifically, I'm going to use the box method. So I'm gonna create a square. I should probably make that smaller. <laughs> okay, so oop, I have my square and I have to create four boxes within it. Um, in the top right corner, I should have two I mean, top left corner, my bad, two, top left corner, I should have two X squared. And in my bottom right corner, I should have a negative three. Okay. We have a condition that we always have to have an X at the top and on the side of my um, first little quadrant, my first section. But outside of that, it's fair game. So what number is going to give me a two X squared? Well, two, that's going to give me two X squared when I multiply these two together, okay? Um, next, I need to figure out what numbers I can put in these two other spots that will make me have a negative three, negative three. Well, I know that, um, one times three will work, but one of them has to be negative. So I'm going to choose three to be negative. Now, doesn't matter the placement because we're still gonna have to double check our work at some point, but um, here I'm going to put one and right there, I'm going to put a negative three, okay? Now we need to remember what our goal is for these two boxes. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to get, let me color coordinate it. We're trying to get that their sum, when we add them together, it's going to give me negative five X. So let's check and see if that's gonna be the case. If I were to multiply two X and negative three, that'll give me negative six X. Oops. And then if I were to now multiply x times one, that should give me x. Will these sums give me negative five x? Yes. So because they do, we have figured out what our binomial should be made of. So I'm going to color coordinate this. Okay. So this should be my first one, and this should be my second binomial. So we should write 2x plus 1 times x minus 3. Next, this is our last one. This is, um, well, the last one for this page, and then we'll move on to page 3. So same process, start off with the GCF. That should be one here. What is my uh, special pattern? Do I have one? No, I don't. And then what is my A value? My A value is three. So again, I have a number that is greater than one. So 
I have to either use the box method or the um, split down the middle method, right? Split the middle method. So for this problem, I'm going to use the split the middle method. We do that, or we start that off by creating my X. And I need to figure out what my A, B, and C values are. This is A, this is B, and this is C. So A times C is negative six, B is five. And now I need to come up with two numbers that when I multiply them together, it's gonna give me six, I mean, negative six. But when I add them together, it's gonna give me a positive five. Um, I would have to have a six and a negative one. Okay, but I can do the same thing that I did um, up here. It's not that easy. I have to rewrite, oops, I have to rewrite this as six, oh yeah, six X and then um, plus one X. Everything else stays the same. All right, I should probably make this a little smaller. I'll make this a little smaller. There we go. Okay. Now I'm going to um, create parentheses and try to find the GCF of each section. Here, three X is what they have in common. And in this one, they have a negative one, negative one. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this as three X. And I should have um, a remainder of just X plus two plus, and then right here, I'm gonna put that negative one on the outside. And here I should have X and then plus two. So if we've done this right, these numbers should end up being the same. So it looks like they did. Because of that, I can pair up my other pieces to give me three X minus one times X plus two. Okay, that's for this page. You guys will be expected to do the other pr problems. Last page, we're almost there, guys. You guys can probably see that I'm still here at 718. <gasps> I wanna go home, <laughs> but we're almost there. We're almost there, okay. We need to graph this um, quadratic equation and list all the features. Now, um, I know about you guys, but I personally like using my calculator to help me out with these types of problems, especially when I'm trying to get a visual of what's going on. Um, so I'm going to go through the process of showing you guys how you y'all would do that. Now, granted, I'm on my iPad and I can't necessarily switch between um, my iPad and my um, like projector right now. So I'm gonna have to use an app, but it's very similar to what your calculator looks like. So again, you would click, um, you would click Y equals, you'd click that button, and then you would type in the equation. So the equation that we had, let me make sure that I'm on the correct page. It would have been um, negative one half, negative one half, close parentheses. And then it would be X plus two squared plus eight. I'm gonna graph this. So it looks like I have an upside down U shape or an N shape. And um, I can see that it touches at, Oh, I'm trying to get the exact point. Uh, it's not quite there. I might have to use my ch my uh, table. My table might give me a more accurate answer. So let's look at oops, second and then graph. Okay. 
So here I'm going to write down, I'm actually gonna use a piece of paper to write this down because I'm not gonna be able to switch between numbers, but I'm gonna write down where my, um, where my y-intercept is. So that means where my um, x equals zero. So that would be at zero, six. And then I'm going to write where my x-intercepts are. So that's where my y is equal to zero. So y, that would be at this point right here. Oops, right below it. So that'd be negative six, zero. And then the other one that I saw was two, zero. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my assignment. And I'm going to write that. My y-intercept, I used my chart for this. I didn't come up with it. I didn't come up with it like from the fly. My y-intercept is zero, six. And my x-intercepts are negative six, zero, and two zero. Okay. So let's graph those points. Um, at that one, negative six, and uh, two. Okay. Now, this looks funky because I haven't written down what my vertex is. Remember, my vertex is given by my h and my k. My h here is negative two and my k is eight. So I would go to the left by two, up by eight. Now this looks a little bit more like a parabola. Oops, there we go. All right, so where's my axis of symmetry? That's gonna be right down the middle. So that would be at x equals, negative two. And then my vertex, well, I literally just figured that out earlier. That should be by negative two, eight. Now, is this a minimum or a maximum? We have that as an upside down U. So since it's an upside down U, it's a max. All right, let's work on our domain and range. Well, again, through that same process of going from left to right, I'm going to have that my domain is negative infinity to positive infinity and my range. So I'm gonna start from the bottom of my graph and I'm gonna work my way up. Well, I see those arrows at the very bottom. So that means I'm gonna have negative infinity because it's gonna keep on going down, down, down. But then when I try to see where it stops, well, it stops right here at this point, which is at eight. That is my range, but I messed up because I actually need my eight to be in brackets, okay? Now it's good. All right, last one. Trying to go through this somewhat quickly so that we can head home, or at least I can head home. <laughs> okay. Um, so here I'm asked to write the equation in vertex form for the parabola graph below. I want to start off by finding where my vertex is. My vertex for this parabola is at 4, 1. Okay, now I'm going to look for a point on my parabola. So let's use, this is five and uh, three. Okay, so we have a point here, five, three. Um, now I'm going to go through the process that I did up above, which was right here. I have a point and I have a vertex. I'm gonna use the same process to try and find out what my A value is. Okay, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I'm running out of time. All right, so we're gonna plug in H and K. That should give me Y equals A times X minus four squared plus one. Then I'm gonna plug in X and Y. So that would give me three equals a times four minus, I mean, five minus four squared plus one. Then I'll simplify that as much as I possibly can. So I'm gonna start off by dealing with whatever's in my parentheses, that'll give me one. And then when I rewrite this, I'll end up with um, three equals a plus one, subtract 
one from both sides, that'll give me A equals two. So A is two. What is my H? Well, that's given by my vertex, so it's four. And my K is one. So if I write this in vertex form, it would be Y equals two times X minus four squared plus one. We are done. I'm ready to go home. All righty. Okay. Bye, y'all. I hope that um, this was of help. Good luck on your review. I'll see you guys on test day.